To transition the world to a greener state and to a net zero carbon world, a lot of investment is done. And train infrastructure in this case is a very interesting place to look at. So I'm very happy to welcome Foslo to this episode of Good Investing Talks. They are maybe a kind of boring company, but they've transitioned over the last years to an interesting peer play into the mobility and train space. I hope you enjoy my conversation with the company. A warm welcome to the Good Investing Talks podcast. I'm your host, Tilman Fersch, and I'm very happy that you're discovering underfollowed investors and underfollowed companies together with me. Before we jump into this conversation, I want to thank my supporters. They help me to keep this channel free and public for everyone. Thank you very much. If you also want to join the Good Investing Supporters Club, please click on the link below. You're very welcome. And now, one last step. Here's the disclaimer for you. All we are doing here is no advice and no recommendation. Please always do your own work. And now, enjoy the video. The audience of Good Investing Talks, it's great to have you back on the podcast. Today, I'm talking with Mr. Trishka of Foslo. And Foslo is located in Verdol. Where is Verdol on the map? Yes, hello, Mr. Fersch. First of all, thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Foslo. Uh, is located roughly 50 kilometers southwest uh, of Dortmund. It's a small city uh, with roughly uh, uh, with up to 20,000 inhabitants. What kind of importance do you have for this region? Yeah, we are among the top employers in this region. So we are not the biggest one in Badol, but uh, I would say among the top three. All in all, we have uh, we employ here 350 people. Major part is related to our fastening systems business unit, um, where we produce fastening systems. Here we have the factory future uh, in Verdol, where we invested heavily over over the last couple of years, all in all, roughly 40 million. So here, roughly 300 people uh, work in that area, and uh, for the headquarters um, for Fossil AG, uh, yeah, this is the remaining part. So all in all, it sums up to. To 350. Many of my viewers are coming from the US. So if you compare the US railway system, the European railway system, how are they different? So you're doing business in both markets, so you maybe have the chance to do a comparison of both markets. Yeah. So the US market, of course, is a very important one for us. So it's among the top uh, uh, markets in the world. Um, the business there is more related uh, on, on on freight than in uh, than in Europe, where you have a passenger and and freight transportation. I would say both more or less at the same level, and therefore the infrastructure is slightly different in uh, and the customer base as well. So in the US we have the huge class one uh, uh, operators, which are all publicly listed, and uh, if they use concrete ties, we are uh, we are supplying them. Um, and the technical specifications, therefore, are slightly different because for heavy haul with high extra loads, you need yeah, special uh, features in our products when it comes to turnals or fastening systems. If you compare it with, with other modes of transportation like uh, um, uh, conventional or, or high speed, uh, and uh, I would say this is a huge difference on, on top of that. Um, I, I would say in, in Europe, it already started uh, that many state national railway operators invest more in the rail infrastructure. Uh, so uh, there was a, a wear and tear in the past. And now, uh, especially we see it in Germany, uh, a lot of uh, state national railway operators like Deutsche Bahn, they started to invest a couple of years ago. And uh, it's not only Germany, it's I would say more or less all over Europe, maybe a slight exception at the moment is France, but in many other regions, uh, demand for our products is at a very good level at the moment. So compared to the US, in the European system, there's a lot of more passenger tra transport and people are riding with high speeds like 200 kilometers or something like this. So what does this, this mean for the railway tracks and the systems, especially with your strength and attention clamps and the sleepers uh, yeah what does this mean the higher speeds and the higher share of passenger traffic yeah so so the forces on the on the rail track and uh, Foslo 
Uh, we are a producer of all the components of a rail track and we understand how uh, how all these components work together. So the forces are completely different. On, on high speed, uh, we have some additional components in our fastening systems uh, to make sure that yeah, at the end, the rail is fixed uh, to the sleeper, uh, which is necessary. And if you're, uh, you're absolutely right, if you run a line with more than 250 kilometers per hour, this is more or less a definition for high speed. And in China, the trains, uh, they have a speed up to 350 kilometers per hour. It's completely different than uh, in, in some parts of, of Europe. They have a speed in conventional lines uh, between you know, 60 and up to 120 kilometers per hour. So uh, you ask for the differences in the systems, just to give you uh, some indication here uh, in the fastening systems area. Uh, in the past, we had more than 60 uh, different systems for each and every application. Uh, and of course, uh, it's, this depends on the specifications uh, of, of the, of the uh, specific country but of course, temperature is an issue as well, and and the usage of the of the lines uh, have a huge importance on the detailed specifications of, uh, of the track. For for turners, for example, um, we use. Um, uh, yeah, it depends. Or the 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 crossings uh, are, are different if you have a conventional line or if you have a high speed line, uh, and uh, they are they are even differences in the technology in 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 Europe uh, so in principle you have the German and the French technology uh, and both are slightly different uh, but of course uh, serving the needs for the customer and I would say uh, in the US uh, we have the Arema standard um, and all in all I think it's fair to state that the uh, quality of the infrastructure in Europe is at a higher level at the moment uh, than in the US. So um, uh, in, I would say in, in Europe, the catch-up already started, but this will definitely continue uh, with all the discussions on CO2 uh, reduction goals going, going forward. And uh, we in the US, I would say we are just at the beginning, but nevertheless, there are huge, uh, huge programs like the Biden Infrastructure Act, which will support our business in the future, especially when it comes to passenger transportation with, uh, with our customer Amtrak, which runs the Northeast Corridor in the US. Maybe a quick follow-up uh, on your products. I think many people can understand what a sleeper is or a turnout, um, but what is a tension clamp and why is a tension clamp important for the railway system? Yeah, yeah. So I think you also have the tension clamps in the back somewhere so people can better imagine them yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're right you can see it right here on the uh, in the back so of course all our products are safety relevant and therefore we have to fulfill high homologation requirements from our customers and the main purpose of a fastening system is to fix the rail to the sleeper uh, and to make sure uh, that of course uh, the train can run smoothly and safely uh, on the track. And depending uh, which train is running and which axle load is, uh, is, is required at the track, you don't need only a, a tension clamp, uh, which is made of wire. This is what we have produced here in the past, but you need a whole system. You know? So you need some dowels uh, and, and screws to fix uh, the, the tension clamp in the sleeper, in most of the cases, it's already uh, the, the dowel is already included uh, in the sleeper, and uh, you need some plastic components um, to make sure, and, and ground plates to make sure that the whole system is stable and fit for use, uh, that you can travel safely and, and do the, the freight transportation in, in, in a safe manner on the track. Maybe let's take the example of the tension clamp. How much? R&D is in such a piece of steel. Yeah, so if you take a first look at, at the tension clamp, it, at first glance, it seems like it's kind of mass product. Uh, but um, 
uh, there's a lot of know-how. This was one of the major reasons why we took the decision to invest here in our factory of the future in Bedol um, um, a couple of years ago. So we invested here 40 million, uh, which on one hand side gives us some advantages on the production cost side. But what is even more important, we have a technology center here and uh, we are developing new generation of, of tension clamps. So the, the product which is in use at the moment, and in many cases, yeah, this was patented back in 1967, and we ran out of the patent uh, a decade ago. Um, so innovation was at a very low level, but when it comes to the specific um, topics uh, and um, specific details, we are seeing as the as the technology leader in this area for good reasons. So there are some companies which copy our products, but if you have some, uh, and sometimes um, you have a breakage of a tension clamp, um, then of course to understand the root cause and to make sure that this doesn't happen again and to find solutions with the customer, I think we here, Foslo is leading and a very good example um, for our uh, innovation strengths is that we and we, we have presented this during the inner transfer which took place last year in September uh, in Berlin. Um, it's a so-called new generation, an M generation tension clamp there with outward, uh, outwardly bent springs arms. And this is completely new. It's a new design. Uh, it strengthens the robustness of our products. Uh, it requires less material and it has a better CO2 footprint. And this all in all gives us some confidence yeah, that we will be um, successful to bring this to the market rather soon. And this clearly underlines that we are the uh, uh, technological leader in that area. And if you and you are cordially in, invited yeah, to visit us here in Verdol um, and uh, to do a, a plant tour uh, together with me. And then if you see the production flow, how it is organized as of today and the machinery we use first uh, to do the bending of the material uh, and, and, and the cutting and then the, the heat treatment and afterwards uh, uh, the coating as, as a final step, uh, yeah, it's it's not so easy as you as you would imagine when you just see the, the product in the field. It's time for a quick Edward Tillman. Here we go. Are you looking for a beautiful and efficient way to analyze stocks? Then please check out what my friends at Stratosphere are building. They have built a great tool to visualize data, to get ideas about ownership of stocks, and many more information that's helpful in your analysis process. You can find that tool via the link below and feel free to sign up. It's free. Thank you for your attention. And now Edward Tillman, Ende. So this is a product you want to win market share with. But another topic that I find interesting is maintenance. Like if we take the example of Verdul where you're located, there's a train running every few minutes. But when you think about like going climate neutral or um, getting more <laughs> sustainable mobility, you have to increase the speed. And so also the maintenance uh, needs increase because the system is used more intense. Is this also something Foslo could profit from? Sure, sure. So this is, of course, a general trend. Uh, if we look at our business, we will, we will this year or in 2022, after, after nine months, we already had an order intake of roughly 1 billion. Yeah, so which was... Uh, a record level for us. Order backlog is uh, is high as well at a record level, and we expect uh, that this trend continues for for the whole year 2022. So, what does this mean? Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. If you look at at Europe over the last decades or, or years, many countries uh, didn't spend sufficient or didn't dedicate sufficient funds to the rail infrastructure to make sure that the quality remains at a very good level. So there was a wear and tear. And now uh, there is a certain catch up in our products, which is definitely 
good for our business. And uh, we see that in many countries, uh, order intake is, is slightly growing. So, and you're absolutely right. There are a lot of initiatives to bring more traffic on rail. So what does this mean? Uh, in, in Germany, and this is, uh, you can't build new lines uh, in a short period of time. So this usually takes a lot of time, and in some cases more than 10 years, and the space is limited. So what needs to be done is first of all, yeah, to upgrade and renew uh, the existing lines. This is what has just been started. And all our products have an, on average, a lifetime, I would say, depending on the usage of the track, between, yeah, let's say, 25 years. So this means all our products are going to be replaced every 25 years. So 4% of the track is going to be renewed every year. And now with a higher utilization of the track, our uh, the lead time of our products uh, will slightly reduce going forward. And just uh, imagine, take into consideration that the average lead time would go down to 20 years only, then 5% of the existing network needs to be replaced each and every year. Uh, so currently we are in the phase of, yeah, catching up, so uh, um, spend what we should have spent it in the past, Got, but going forward, we expect that the demand will stay at a higher level, and uh, as, as more the track is needed, uh, the higher the replacement rate will be. And there is one important, uh, other important uh, aspect, and this will clearly change our way of doing business going forward. Because for the for the operators, um, availability of the track will be key in the future. So they can't afford a closure of a track for because of non-availability of some components, um, because the track is urgently needed uh, to uh, to transport goods uh, and passengers. So here, and this is new. Uh, for us, because the railway industry was seen as you know, not really innovative in the past, now this is changing you know, with the terms of digitization. New innovations uh, are coming to the market, and, we, and uh, we are one of the leading companies in that area because the availability of the track is getting more and more important for the customer. And here, Foslo, next to the component business, uh, so we, we have all the relevant components for, our, for the rail track in our portfolio, uh, which means fastening systems, uh, concrete ties, turnouts, um, um, and, and tension clamps, uh, fastening systems, turnouts, um, uh, and concrete ties. But uh, we offer services for the rail track as such so we have services in our portfolio to extend the lifetime of the rail uh, and all of this uh, yeah, will uh, will gain some importance going forward so uh, let's take Deutsche Bahn as an example um, they need to uh, make sure that the rail in the field can be used longer than in the past so typically what you do is that after a certain period of time, you exchange and replace the whole uh, the rail track. Uh, so the rail which is uh, uh, which is on the track after let's say twenty five years. So now what has started a couple of years ago is that uh, um, that there are certain uh, services available like milling um, to reduce the failures on the track by removing. Uh, some millimeters of the surface of the rail, which extends the lifetime uh, to a certain extent. But even more, uh, this is not really preventive. Uh, and therefore, there are now some technologies in the market. And here we have a USP um, in, the, in the field of high-speed grinding. So maybe, maybe I can give you some more, some more uh, information about high-speed grinding, what it's all about. And then... Uh, 
we will see the importance that it especially has in, in Germany and uh, will have in other, in other European markets as well. So for high-speed grinding, we offer services to grind the surface of a rail track with a speed of up to 80 kilometers per hour. Uh, and this is unique. No one else can do that. Uh, we offer this service already in China, and now we had a, a breakthrough and did a press release uh, last September um, to offer that services in, in Germany as well. So the big advantage for the customer Deutsche Bahn is that they don't need to close down the track while they are doing the maintenance. Uh, and this is new. So when it comes to conventional grinding uh, or, or to milling, uh, you have to stop the traffic on the line to do the maintenance. And we have some um, services in our portfolio which clearly uh, has some benefits for the customer because you can still run the line. And in between, with 80 kilometers per hour, we are able to do our services. And uh, here, the speed of innovation is extremely high. So one key aspect why we were successful to bring this to the uh, to the market uh, in Germany was uh, that we recently have equipped our our yellow machines, our high speed grinding trains. Not not only the big ones, the high speed grinding, but we have small applications for urban transport as well as the high speed grinding city with sensors. And now we can first show the customer the result of our grinding measures. Uh, and, and secondly, we collect additional information to give uh, the customer informa additional information about the condition of the track and maybe uh, uh, to give them some advice which services should be done on top of that to make sure that the availability of the track uh, increases going forward. And here we are, one of the leading companies we have shown seen some good examples and nice projects in the past. And this is certainly something uh, where we see high growth potential in the uh, in the future. If we talk about maintenance, I also have to think about the Chinese network where you're already doing business with. And you told me that you're already growing by the growth of the Chinese network, which is expanding a lot. Um, but also, if you think about this, the network that was built 20 or 30 years ago, is this also a chance to win there in maintenance and renewal contracts with the Chinese network? Sure. So this will come sooner or later, no doubt. Uh, so uh, normally the, uh, yeah, the, the life cy uh, cycle or the lead time of our products um, uh, in the China is a little bit higher, although it's very high speed, but it's a uh, slap track and not ballast, ballasted track. Um, but Take Germany as an example, or, or Foslo in total, maybe. I would say, as of today, or since one or two years back, more around 85% of our business was replacement. Yeah, so uh, old equipment out, put new components in. Uh, and in China, it's completely the other way around. So as, as you said, they started to build new high-speed lines uh, back in 2007, and right now they have a huge network already of 40,000 kilometers and they will expand it over the next 12 years until 2035 to 70,000 kilometers. So far, no maintenance needed uh, because if the average lifetime is, uh, is around 20 years for these components or might maybe even slightly longer, the maintenance business is something that will develop going forward. It's it started at a very low level, but in, in a couple of years or a decade, the Chinese, they will reduce uh, or, or stop to build new lines once they have achieved this uh, 70,000 kilometers network. And then the situation will be similar, like in Germany, uh, that the replacement business will kick in. And here, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, worth to mention that uh, yeah, we currently have a market share of around 20% uh, for, for, for many years right now in the high-speed area. And our system is slightly different from the system that uh, uh, the Chinese competitors have in their portfolio. So there is a certain likelihood that when it comes to replacement, uh, that our products uh, will be in the field uh, as well. So sooner or later, the Chinese market will 
move more in the direction uh, like we have in Europe. But in, in Europe, of course, uh, um, uh, yeah, the, um, many lines uh, have been built for for um, 100 years ago or, or even longer. So uh, the market here is very mature and in China we are right at the beginning. But um, China will nevertheless be a, a growth market for us, maybe not in the high-speed segment when it comes to building of new lines, um, but there are other areas and the Chinese, they now start to build uh, new lines between cities, which are at the moment at the high-speed lines where the trains are running 350 kilometers per hour. There will be some uh, connections between the cities uh, uh, at the line, some cross connections where the speed is up to 250 kilometers per hour. We expect first tenders in the market soon and then in the next quarters. And we think that we have a, quite a, a good product here to gain a certain market share in that area as well. Like uh, we we did some steps over the last three years with our with a newly formed joint venture uh, three years back named Anyang. Uh, in the area of conventional lines and and uh, in the UTS business. So China is uh, an important market for us. It will stay an important market for us. And uh, yeah, but uh, it's the mechanism and, uh, of the market is at the moment still completely different from what we see in Europe. Here the market uh, is mainly dedicated to, uh, to existing lines. But um, yeah, Due to all the political discussions and the uh, high political wall that we see when it comes to CO2 reduction targets, um, not only upgrading of existing lines, but building new lines will play will play a, a certain role going forward. Uh, just worth to mention uh, one or two pro uh, two, two projects. Um, let's take the Rail Baltica um, project uh, as an example. So Rail Baltica is, is a new line which is under discussion for roughly 30 years right now. Yeah, so it's a line from Warsaw to Tallinn yeah, through uh, Lithuania and, and Latvia um, with a length of up to close to 1,000 kilometers, uh, kilometers. And there will be a tunnel between uh, Tallinn uh, and Helsinki. Uh, slightly more than 100 kilometers. So all in all, the line has a length of roughly 1,000 kilometers, slightly slightly more, from Helsinki to Warsaw. And this is a new line, and this has been discussed for many years. But each and every time, funding was an issue. And especially after the financial crisis, 2008, 2009, 2010, uh, um, funding was not available. And with a strong political will to bring or uh, to uh, to have a higher usage of rail as a by far greenest mode of transportation going forward, now funds are available, and this line uh, will be built. Uh, current plans are until 2026, so we should see some tenders in the market for our products over the next quarters. And this is just one uh, one indication of yeah, what, what is happening in in, in Europe right now. There, there are plans in many countries. For example, in, in France, they are going, or, or there, there are plans to build new high-speed lines as well yeah, to make sure that in the future, domestic flights are no longer needed. Yeah. So the, the market, the French market at the moment, is at a rather low level due to the high losses that uh, SNCF suffered over over the last couple of years during the pandemic. But uh, recently, they announced that they uh, made some. Uh, some positive earnings uh, in the in the last year, and that they now want to invest more in the infrastructure as well. There are plans, uh, a, a program called X2, uh, with a clear target to double uh, pa um, passenger and and freight transportation over, over the next years in France as well. So sooner or later, uh, we expect the market to recover and that some funds will be available uh, to modernize and even upgrade the infrastructure and even build some, some new lines. All this investment we are talking about happens behind the background or in the framework of demographic change. Um, like also a lot of the state agencies will lose a lot of their skilled workers because they retire. And 
What chance or hurdle is demographic change for Foslo? Indeed, this is a, a, a huge topic. Yeah? So, so first of all, uh, yeah, in in the future, more people will will live in big cities, so the trend uh, will not stop, and uh, the car as as a mode of transportation will not be the solution in, in these areas. So, there will be a, a, a higher focus on UTS networks, and uh, definitely uh, there will be some growth in that area. Um, the retirement uh, and the lack of competency uh, is, is, a, is a topic which gives us a lot of opportunities um, um, going forward. Um, maybe maybe it's, uh, it's worth to spend some, some minutes about the DB. So at the, at, the, uh, at the moment, DB scolding is more or less on vogue. Yeah? But I'm not particip participating here. So DB is a very, very important customer for us. They have a lot of experts. Uh, technology level at, at DB is high. Um, but you're right, uh, retirement in the future uh, will not be a pr only a problem for, for Deutsche Bahn, but for many other um, state national railways as well. And there will be a, yeah, a lack maybe of competency, or at least it must be, it must make sure uh, that the knowledge stays within the state national railway operators. But in some cases, it might make sense yeah, to outsource um, uh, some activities to suppliers like Foslo. Yeah? So we uh, uh, are seen on the DB side not only as a, as a, as a supplier, but as a partner. Yeah? So we de develop together with DB, for example, uh, the business of, of high-speed grinding, and we are looking uh, at other options as well. And we have a lot of services in our portfolio, uh, which Deutsche Bahn could make use of. Uh, and of course, it's up to us to demonstrate to them going forward that we are the right partner and we, we are able to solve their problems uh, And maybe then uh, yeah, we can increase our services business for, for Deutsche Bahn uh, as well going forward. At, at least this is a clear target for us. Hey, Tillman here. It's great that you've made it that far into the video. And I think it shows a certain passion for investing you are having. If you want to dive deeper and go further down the rabbit hole, you're invited to apply to my community, Good Investing Plus. It's a place that's very helpful to people who are ambitious about investing. Uh, it's helpful to investment talent as well as um, experienced fund managers. So if you're interested, please click on the link below. And now, without further ado, enjoy the conversation. So we've been a bit on a higher or meta level uh, with our discussion till now. But what? let's jump on the concrete, like the more focused fo fossil level. So how has the company changed over the last five years? We'll compare Foslo today to Foslo five years ago. What is different with Foslo? Oh, this was a very, very long process. So uh, I would even go back slightly uh, until 2014. Uh, at, at that point in time, we took the decision to clearly focus on the rail infrastructure only. Uh, at that time, We had one division, uh, which was called uh, transportation. So we were part of the rolling stock area. Um, but we decided to, to get rid and to sell the business. Why? For, mainly for three reasons. First of all, first of all, our clear ambition, and maybe we will come to that later, is to be a double-digit margin company going forward. So midterm, this is our ambition for all our divisions, and long-term, this is a target for the group. And we are convinced that in the rail infrastructure business, this is possible. And on the other way, uh, on the other hand, uh, this is very hard to achieve or nearly impossible to generate these margins in the rolling stock area. Secondly, uh, we want to be among the top market leaders in this market we are in, uh, and if possible, uh, on, on, on a global scale. And we are number one in fastening systems worldwide, and we are number two uh, globally uh, in the turnout business. 
And in the Ronix stock business, this was not possible at all. So if you compete with Siemens, Alstom, Bombardier, or CRRC, uh, uh, it doesn't make sense to compete to compete with them. Uh, and a third reason was it's a risk profile of the huge contracts you have in the rolling stock areas. This is something we, we didn't feel comfortable any longer. And now in the rail infrastructure, the risk profile is, is much lower than in the rolling stock area. So we sold this off. And, and then a couple of years later or in parallel, we did a performance program in 2019. And this was a huge change for Foslow as an organization. Um, so we sold loss-making entities because we found out that we were not fit for future. So our uh, cost position um, was not best in class. So um, there was hardly no growth in the company. Margins were stable or even slightly decreasing. So what we did is uh, that we... Uh, did an analysis of all loss-making act, uh, activities, sold them off or restructured them, uh, or in some cases uh, closed them down. And on top of that, we reduced the workforce uh, by roughly 7% all over the world. So this was a huge step, but this was urgently needed to make sure that we are able to reach our ambitions going forward. So this was, and this took quite a while, um, I would say now the process is more or less finished. Um, still, still we have some uh, yeah, some activities in, in in France where we where we need to improve. But all in all, I would say the performance program is done. Um, but it was a critical situation for our employees coming from a company with a sales of 1.3 billion now shrinking down to. Uh, around 850 and doing a performance program and they offer a lot of people. People ask us, our employees, and it was a fair question. Uh, what does FOSLO stand for? Uh, what is a North Star? So we decided in 2020 to run a, a broad strategy uh, project. We invited more than 100 employees, discussed with them back and forth what is key for our for our business in the future. Uh, finally, we aligned on on 30, roughly slightly more than 30 strategic actions, um, which we presented to the capital markets in December 2022. 20, uh, uh, and since then, we are clearly following that path, and this gives us purpose and orientation. And this is one of the, uh, I would say, success factors why Foslo was able to grow much faster than the market uh, of the last two years. And why we expect that going forward, uh, our ambition is to, to grow faster uh, than, uh, than the market. And recently, the UNIF, they gave an update uh, about the expectations of the market going forward. They expect an average growth rate of 3.8%. Uh, and we have clearly underlined over the last two years, at least if you take the midst of our uh, guidance for, for fiscal year 2022, uh, where we have seen growth in the ballpark of around uh, 8% uh, of the last two years. And this gives us some confidence yeah, that we are on the right way um, for, for two reasons. First of all, we did our homework, and now secondly, and, and this is, will be a, a key driver going forward, um, uh, we, we see that the first tenders, which have been discussed for many years, now, now come to the market. Um, the railway industry, and especially our industry, so they have long lead times. So um, we recognized... Uh, and this starts started, I would say, three or four years back, that many projects were discussed in detail, um, which have been has have been more or less dormant for quite a while because of funding issues. Now the customers they came back and discussed with us all the specifications. Normally it takes, let's say, two to three years until the tenders come to the market. Then uh, the tender award might take additional 12 months. And then if we start to deliver our products, it might take two or three years uh, even more. Yeah? So from the pre-tendering phase to the final delivery of our products, sometimes it's more than five years. 
and what we what we saw or, or currently uh, observe is that this has started for several reasons. So there are huge in, uh, infrastructure programs all over the world announced, have been announced a couple of years ago. And now, yeah, to a certain extent, we see some growth, but even more uh, in our P&L on top line in the sales, but even more we see a record order intake and a record order backlog. So uh, we are quite confident that we can continue this trend and that we will see some additional growth in 2023, uh, both on the sales side and uh, on the uh, EBIT side. And in the current global environment, you know, where, uh, uh, where polar crisis is one of the major buzzwords, I think this is a, a very good development uh, that we uh, yeah, are, are, uh, that we are really confident yeah, that we will continue the way that we have started uh, two or three years back. Uh, so there was, to sum it up, there was a huge change. Uh, we clearly transformed our company. This is not finalized for sure, so uh, you can't implement a strategy completely in two years. But I think we are addressing the right topics, uh, market topics, product development topics, uh, improving on the on the services side, and uh, to improve our organization with, with several measures uh, that that we are fit for future, uh, uh, are more competitive uh, and can increase our market share and show some profitable growth in the future. As societies, we are also working towards the climate target. Uh, 2015, many societies want to become climate neutral and invest in this way. And I think Raywell has a crucial part to play here. So does this have an impact on the clock speed in which your industry is operating? So have things spe speed up over the last years? Um, so uh, yes and no. So, uh, yes, because funding is more available. Uh, so if, if you now look in some areas like, like uh, US, there was a Biden bill, which uh, Biden infrastructure bill, uh, which was released uh, roughly one, one year back uh, with 66 billion US dollars for a Amtrak only, and they run the Northeast Corridor uh, in the US. We, we see many projects in, uh, in the next generation uh, EU or the European Green Deal where projects will be financed in the future and maybe to, to some extent it has already been started. But there are many other regions in the world like Egypt uh, uh, where we have won a first uh, nice tender to build up, uh, uh, to equip a new high-speed line with our fastening systems. And in Australia, for example, where uh, the Indian Trail project, where we are in a very good position. So all in all, funds are there. But does this mean that the speed um, to, to build the new lines increases? I would say uh, only, only to a minor extent, because the planning which is needed to build a new line, this has not changed. Yeah? So there are a lot of uh, requirements uh, to be done to make, uh, and very often, especially in, in Europe, uh, 10 years is nothing uh, from, from first plans to finally build the lines. And we have seen that in, in many countries that even if funds are available, the planning capacities are limited. So in this regard, I, I would say, okay, we, we know that more projects will come, but the the speed of one single project, I think there is no speed up. But all in all, due to the uh, high number of projects in the market and the changed requirements of our customer, you know, that they are now uh, uh, more and more focusing on the availability of the existing network, this clearly changes our industry, uh, gives innov uh, innovation a much higher relevance than it, this was done in the past. And here, companies in the railway infrastructure like Foslo, they clearly need to adjust. And therefore, it was quite good that we, uh, that we already incorporated this in our strategy, that we are agile uh, when it comes to find new solutions for our customers.
as the quality of your demand and then also the quality of your revenues improved over the last year. So if you go back 10, 20 years, uh, investments in infrastructure, especially railways, were always a topic when it came to downturns of the economy that they were cut and they weren't seen as needed. But now with the focus on climate neutrality and climate change, I think this could have an impact on the quality of your revenues and the quality of your demand because people really want to do this and need to do this um, instead of just seeing it as a can-be um, investment. Yeah, um, a very good question. We uh, we will see. Um, I'm I'm extremely convinced uh, that uh, uh, that you are right uh, that there will be a this is higher demand for our products going forward. Why? Political will is there. Rail is by far the greenest mode of transportation. But uh, we we were uh, yeah, looking looking ten years back. Uh, there was a, a, a very good overall environment for for our products as well. The market was quite strong. But then we see uh, authority measures all over the world, uh, and you mentioned it. There were some spend, uh, some um, some cuttings uh, in in the overall budgets in the railway infrastructure market. Today, we don't see that. Yeah. So still, uh, funds seem to be available. New projects are announced, and uh, it will be more or less a question how fast uh, these projects could be handled could be handled going forward uh, but it seems that funds are available this does not mean that maybe one or the other project uh, uh, will will be delayed going forward yeah? because uh, we were affected hardly as well by the rising of raw material prices uh, not for slow only but the whole, but the whole infrastructure uh, rail infrastructure business and therefore uh, some projects yeah, might be put on hold, yeah, which is not the case at the moment, uh, but we cannot exclude that this might happen in some areas. But all in all, um, we don't see uh, that, that that this trend will end. Yeah? It's, it's more the other way around. Uh, funds seem to be available and, and new new projects are going to be planned. And we, yeah, a good indicator is our order intake and our order backlog. So for, for for order intake and order backlog after after nine months last year we have shown uh, record numbers and we we most likely will never start into a new year with such a high level of order backlog um, and I think here uh, it's, it's worth to mention that at Foslo if you look at our order backlog these are only firm orders so um, on top of that we have roughly. Uh, between 300 and 350 million euro of sales, which come out of frame contracts, uh, which are not part of the order backlog at the beginning of a year, because we only put them into our order intake and order backlog once we have received the corner from the customer. So this this is a very good indicator. And if you look at the sales level we have in our in in, in our books uh, when we look into 2023, this has this has increased compared to prior years uh, and therefore uh, we think we will grow the company uh, once again in 2023. Yeah. If we talk about inflation, uh, it also can be an interesting topic to better understand new, your negotiating power. Like inflation is still high, but we might be coming down a bit and you're mainly impacted by steel price inflation like, because energy is not a super huge thing for you in the cost basis of your products so how has this been on the negotiation side were your partners willing to renegotiate or have they tried to put you down and put pressure on your profitability or or do you see do, do we see you as a partner they also want to be happy yeah so 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 we are in an industry um where typically you, you cannot pass on any additional burden from the from the material side. This is what we have seen in, in 2022. So the uh, the increase for raw materials was huge. Yeah, for some components like wire uh, that we use for our tension clamps, 
the price increase uh, over the last uh, 18, 18 months uh, was more than 100%. Uh, and therefore, we, we started quite early in 2022 to renegotiate with all our customers on a global scale, uh, uh, m most projects, um, even, even those contracts where we didn't have a price escalation formula. So we uh, went for, uh, we negotiated higher prices, uh, down payments as a standard, uh, and to include price escalation formulas going forward. And um, now we, there was a, a period, especially over after the, the Russian uh, invasion started, uh, where it was very hard for us uh, to finally judge on the, on the potential impact for our P&L going forward. But we did a quite good job. So uh, all in all, and I think this is worth to mention, uh, the absolute EBIT. Yeah? We are, we are. If you take the midst of our of our guidance, we are even slightly higher than the 2021 numbers. Yeah? In 2021, we had an EBIT of 72 million euros, um, despite the facts yeah, that we had a huge additional burden from the material side. But, uh, um, of course, we cannot neglect that it had a certain impact on our margin because even, even if you are able to pass everything through, uh, you have a deterioration in the on the margin side. Uh, let's take an example. You have 1 billion of sales with 80% EBIT and the margin is 8%. Uh, and... Um, if you now have 50 million additional costs, which you can pass on by 100%, then you have 1.05 billion of sales, but still 80% EBIT, and your EBIT margin goes down to 7.6%, although you have done a quite good job. So there was a certain uh, uh, impact then on, on our profitability um, in, in 2022. So our, our latest guidance is, 7 to 7.5%, yeah, which compares to 77 the year before. But uh, yeah, nevertheless, nevertheless, uh, uh, if, you, if you take the midst of our guidance and calculate the EBIT, it will be the highest EBIT in the Foslo Group since 2012. Yeah. So there are a lot of ch uh, challenges. Uh, we, we found a way in 2022 to handle this. Looking forward, you mentioned the, the energy costs. At, at the moment, energy costs are at a rather low level. Uh, but of course, we needed to secure some, some, some prices uh, uh, in October, November 2022 uh, to make sure that uh, uh, energy is available in 2023. So, so from, our, from today's view, uh, the challenges will not stop. Even for material, for some components like wire, we see prices are going down. For some other components, there is a certain delay uh, uh, um, on the prices for our products. So, and for many components, um, not only plastic components, but for some steel components as well, we expect a further price increase in, in 2023. So, uh, which we which we have to handle. But all in all, the magnitude uh, should be should be lower than in 2023. And and offset, of course, uh, due to the high inflation you mentioned, there will be uh, an increase in in global salaries. Uh, that's that's for sure. So this uh, will be higher uh, than the average numbers in the uh, in the past. So it will be an additional burden uh, on our PNL as well. But we are quite confident yeah, that we can handle that once again. From the inflation uh, top line, I think the, the impact will be a little bit lower uh, uh, than in 2022 because we were faced with uh, high increases in material prices already 2022 and were able to pass on uh, the majority of it uh, to our customers. So one portion uh, of the growth uh, that we will uh, we, that we will have realized in 2022, uh, and by the way, the first time in the rail infrastructure we will exceed the one billion in sales, uh, was driven by by the pass on. But uh, you know, the other portion is still coming from the uh, not still is coming from the operations and the very strong demand in, in in many countries that we see currently.
you already mentioned this huge order backlog Foslo has. What impact does this order backlog have on investments? Because you're delivering a physical product and that's not easily scalable. Um, so you have to do investments to fulfill the demand. Yeah. Yeah, so a, a very good question. If, if if you look at our at our business at the moment, so in the core components, I would say we have sufficient uh, capacity available. Uh, as as mentioned in the US, we are we are coming from uh, from from a situation where the demand in the market was quite quite low, uh, and for fast link systems, we have some capacity available. So there are more or less no capacity constraints. Uh, in the in the services area. Uh, as well, um, it's, a, it's to a certain extent a mixed picture. In some areas, uh, um, we have already a very good utilization of our uh, of our machinery, uh, and in some others, we had some uh, capacity available, like for the high speed grinding. So uh, the growth we will see in 2023 uh, will come in this area, but cap and capacity is available as well. In in our turnout business. Um, where we are, uh, we have several production sites all over the world, mainly in, in France, but, in, uh, but as well in, in, in Scandinavia and Sweden and in, and in Australia. Uh, in some areas, we are already running at a high capacity utilization. So we slightly changed the organization in this regard. Now we have a functional organization. We have one COO in place who clearly oversees the situation all over the world and uh, yeah, try and we try to be flexible that whenever necessary and, and possible that we shift some um, some works uh, to the next site but uh, nevertheless um, we will uh, we will take or uh, we will need to do some further capex uh, in, in the turnout business um, in, in Australia, uh, we we will invest after we have won the huge contract for Indian Rail. Uh, so all in all, from a group perspective, of the last, I think it's worth to state that over the last two years, we invested slightly less than the depreciation rate, and we expect this to 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 change going forward. So depreciation rate is at the moment around fifty five. So I would expect uh, a capex um, more between sixty and seventy going forward, taking into consideration that in some areas and uh, we uh, we need to increase the the capacity slightly and therefore need some additional capex. I think over the last like five years or ten years, you've put a one hundred fifty year old man, Mr. Foslo, in a boot camp to become more profitable and stronger as a company. So. What is your goal in terms of profitability and yeah, profits you want to achieve with Foslo? So, so our, our clear ambition is to, to be a, a double digit EBIT margin company. So, uh, this is how we organize uh, uh, Foslo. This is one integral part of our strategy, and uh, we are making good progress here. So, so midterm. We expect all our divisions to be at, at 10 percent. Um, so um, at the moment we are at the ballpark between eight and I would say 10 percent in some areas already, but uh, we want to be at at least 10 percent in all our three divisions. And this will take us, uh, I would say two to three years, maybe in, in, in one or two divisions we are uh, yeah, we will already achieved the, the target a little bit earlier. So this means that at group level, the EBIT margin would be around 9%. Yeah? Why is that? Because we have some holding costs. We discussed uh, the, the headquarters uh, right at the beginning, uh, which is here located in Vedol. Here we have costs of around 16 to 17 million per year. And if we want to be a double-digit margin company in the group, uh, we have to cover these costs as well, which means that we have to further increase the profitability in our divisions. Uh, and this will take a little bit longer. Yeah? So our long-term goal is uh, to, to be a double-digit EBIT margin on a group level. And we will take all additional yeah, measures and steps uh, to come there. It's, it's a long way, but we are convinced that we are able to achieve it. You have this margin goal 
maybe let's try to invert this a bit. What could happen or should happen that you fail with this margin goal, that you don't get the margin you're operating in. So it's more like a, a thinking exercise about like thinking what risks are there and how they could happen or hit you. Uh, I would prefer uh, what must happen to achieve it, but of course uh, it's a mixture. So I, I think in China, I mentioned at the beginning we have a very good market share of uh, of, of 20 percent for for uh, since a couple of years, and uh, everything we intend to do for 2023 is already covered by our order backlog. Um, but uh, uh, but this business, of course, is important. So if there would be a change uh, in the demand from the customer, or uh, if our market share would go down. Uh, this this would be a challenge, but we have no indications that that uh, this uh, th that this will happen going forward for for many reasons. Uh, on, on top of that, yeah, we have done the f factory of the future here uh, in Bedol, um, and we are now very cost competitive. So we uh, we have some benefits of around five million per year coming out of the, the new factory, uh, but we suffered to a certain extent on the. Uh, high gas prices here uh, in Bedol because the heat treatment is, is is done with gas. So if the if the gas prices would explode once again uh, and there will, uh, would be no additional measures from the government to reduce the impact, this would be a challenge for the fastening systems business. Um, for Thai technologies, um, Australia is a very good and solid market, uh, so I don't see any risk on that side. Uh, in the US, um, I, I, I mentioned at the beginning that the demand for our products was very low. So if it would stay at these levels, uh, then there might be a risk that we don't end up with a 10% with a margin then overall in, in, in the core components division. But sooner or later, there must be a, a, a pick up in the market so this is what we have seen in the past as well that the market is quite volatile but this will be uh, a requirement to clearly surpass the 10 percent in the core components division for customized modules as well in in france uh, which is our uh, uh, our home turf and our the the biggest production site sites are in france and we have acquired a french company uh, 21 years back uh, yeah, if the French government uh, would stop uh, to support spendings uh, in the rail infrastructure, uh, um, I think, but this is not only true for France, but uh, Europe in total, this might put our target in danger to be to be double digit in that area. In many other areas, we already see that the demand is quite high. So, uh, and in life cycle solutions, the, um, a major driver in 2023 will be high-speed grinding. So this will, uh, all in all, and uh, the, the strong demand, not only in Germany, but in other countries as well, this will bring us much closer to the 10%. So if the, the, the biggest risk, of course, is uh, if, the, uh, if the overall trend to CO2 reductions and the political will uh, to to bring more more traffic on rail, if this would change, uh, then this would certainly have an impact uh, on our business, and uh, we would need to take some additional steps to nevertheless a ten percent uh, uh, target uh, when it comes to even margin. Yeah. But it's up to you to decide how likely this is. Uh, if uh, if uh, yeah, so the sustainability efforts of all the governments uh, worldwide will will change or not. Your margin is my opportunity, and it's a well-known Bezos quote. And uh, with a high margin of 10%, you also run into the risk that more competition comes into this space and tries to outcompete you. Like, where do you especially see such a competition risks? And where do you see, like, yeah, certain risk coming from competitors on your margins? Yeah. So, so, so first of all, um, in the fasting systems era, we are, are number one on a global scale, and there's only one competitor who's acting globally as well. Uh, it's it's a, a French company, um, 
and we have yeah, some competitors in some markets in Europe. Um, so this is not new. And uh, I think we have done the necessary steps like the uh, investment here in our factory of the future to have a good uh, cost, cost position um, to be successful in the future. Um, in, in, the, in the concrete tile business, we have a 70% market share or 60 to 70% in Australia and, when, and in North America, uh, including Mexico and Canada, we are more or less at the same level. So we have a very strong footprint there. In, in the turnout business, we are a clear number one on a global scale. Uh, there's one company, um, um, it's a subsidiary of the Austrian steelmaker First Alpine. Um, they they are number one in that market because they really have a strong footprint in in China and the US, and we are not present, for example, in the US and in China. We only have an equity consolidated company. In in life cycle solutions, uh, it's twofold. So we are number one when it comes to milling, uh, which is uh, one measure to increase uh, the the lifetime of rail. Uh, and when it comes to track supply, which means um, welding, stationary welding, and uh, logistics of of uh, of welded rail, all in all, the market entry barriers in our industry are quite high, because typically all our products are safety relevant, and if you if you want to equip or to de- deliver to a country, you first have to proof that your that your products are fit for use yeah, so you need a test track uh, and after after a couple of years uh, you maybe get homologation and then in many cases uh, and this is especially true for for uh, turnouts and for sleepers uh, you have to take the decision if you want to invest in a country because lo- in many in many areas local production is needed. It doesn't make sense to sh- to ship, for example, concrete ties from Australia to Europe. Uh, so you need to invest, uh, and then uh, once you took the decision, uh, you can participate in tenders, and you then you meet Foslo, which have a really good market position in the in in the, in the, in the field. And uh, a very good, yeah, I would say a cost position as well. So there are some hurdles uh, for new participants to enter, but uh, nevertheless, of course, uh, if the market is attractive and if we are really able to achieve double-digit margins, yeah, some some. Uh, other companies, maybe even from outside the rail industry, they will certainly look uh, at the business. yeah, but uh, I would say we are we are prepared yeah uh, to, uh, to to manage this situation as well. Sadly, we are running a bit out of time, so I I want to end this interview with three short questions. Um, you can answer them quickly. Um, okay, I will try to do my best. The, the first question is about the shareholder structure. Sadly, the largest shareholder, Mr. Thiele, died I think two years ago. And uh, there's a bit of a yeah, struggle in the family about uh, their wealth. And do you see a certain risk that the family exits at a certain time? And this could put pressure on the other shareholders because they sell or are they more long-term oriented? Yeah, so, so far, we don't have any indication uh, that uh, that's, uh, it will change uh, like it has been in the past. So we are in, in constant and... Good communication with the heirs of uh, Heinz Mantile, so with the uh, wife, the daughter, and the executor. Um, what we receive is positive feedback, so they all, all of them they well understand uh, our our strategy, uh, which of course gives us uh, stability going forward uh, uh, to to follow the path that we have implemented and uh, that has been discussed of course uh, with with uh, Heinz and Mantile a couple of years a uh, couple of years back so uh, the family trust is is not finally set up um, so we we are waiting for this so uh, we we know what what is mentioned in the press so we don't have any more information on this um, but to sum this up we have no indication that the long term shareholding might change uh, is this a guarantee 
of course, it, it is not, uh, but uh, at least this is how we see it as of today. Do you or other parts of the management own shares? Um, when I was when I when I started at Foslo uh, a couple a couple of years back uh, in 2009, uh, we had a, a, a program for employees. So I I owned roughly 50 50 shares of Foslo coming out of this program. Um, but on top uh, on top of that, of course, our long term incentive is based. Uh, or, or two third of it uh, is based on the development of the Foslo share price uh, uh, in absolute terms and in comparison to the relevant indices. So, a very high portion of my compensation is uh, is related to the development of the Foslo share. When has management last bought shares, and why? Management, huh, I, I think, um, last time. Um, executive board member bought shares. This was you know, more than a decade ago. Uh, so, uh, so this is uh, not. Uh, it's it's of course something we we, we look at, uh, but but finally uh, you have to take into into consideration that the major portion of of uh, of the salary of the board members is already dedicated to the development of the of the company. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, over the last couple of years, uh, there were, uh, if, if I remember well, no, no board member who acquired or sold some shares in the Foslo stock. Yeah, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. And thank you very much for answering my questions. And um, also to the audience, I want to say, say thank you that you stayed till here and wish you a great day. And bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Bye.